So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us for this month's Digging In with TPS MTSU. Um, we did take a little break last month um, on our usual Digging In day. We were doing our first in-person workshop um, since March of 2020. Um, so we decided we would uh, forego last month and pick back up uh, here in August. So our topic today is staff favorites. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why we decided to go with that um, as our topic. But before we do that, just a couple quick reminders. Um, let's see if I get my screen to advance. All right, there we go. Um, so if you would, again, we are recording, so please keep your mics muted uh, during the course of the session. Um, and also be sure to rename yourself first and last. And again, we want this to be interactive, so feel free to use that chat box uh, and our reaction buttons as well. So we've kind of updated. Uh, so we have a QR code that you can use now to get to that contact sheet. So if you want to use that, and then uh, Layla or Stacey one will also drop the link in the chat box for us. But if you would fill that out, that does help us keep track of who has participated um, in our digging in sessions. So I'll leave that up here for just a second as we are getting a chance to, to use that or to get that link there in the chat box. And as with all of the other um, episodes in this series, we do have a Padlet where you can find all of the resources uh, that we use uh, in today's session, as well as all of our past sessions as well. And so there's a wealth of information there on that Padlet. Uh, we'll drop that link in the chat box and then also we'll, we'll come back and circle back around to that here at the end as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Stacy to talk a little bit about why we decided to do staff favorites this month. Hi, everybody. I am going to go to um, the newsletter uh, right now because it, I do explain this in the little blurb uh, that I write uh, every month. But uh, so I, I, I had two reasonings. Um, one is <clears throat> we had a very, very busy past month. Uh, Kira and I and all of our colleagues at the Center for Historic Preservation um moved offices uh from the buildings that we had been in for 30 years uh and into a new suite of offices in the middle of campus and so that took up most of our time and we wanted to pick something that was a bit less time consuming for us but also something that was a bit of a relief uh, and kind of fun work for us so we decided to do another issue of staff favorites. Um, we had done one before back in February 2019. Uh, and another reason why we do this is because we, we've done over 151 issues of the newsletter, plus countless primary source sets and lesson plans and all sorts of other things. And we know that our website is a little hard to search through, although it's fairly easy to browse through. Um, so we've created so many good things over the years that we realize it's easy to forget. Uh, I know we sometimes forget that we did something. Uh, I'm like, oh, wait, Kira, did you do this already? You know, we do that. So we wanted to kind of bring up some of the things, uh, revisit some of the things that we thought were particularly good or might be still very helpful and relevant uh, right now. So that's that's why we did it. And we hope that you can um, let us know uh, what some of your favorite ones are. Uh, that would be cool if you just wanna tell us in the chat box at all uh, during this session, um, you know, let us know, even if you don't remember exactly what it was, uh, we, we always wanna hear from you, uh, so. Yes, and so uh, we're gonna highlight uh, some of these today, as we usually do during digging in, um, but we're not going to go in exact order. The first one that we're going to highlight today is the one on political cartoons that uh, Layla has highlighted for us in this particular issue um, on the top of page three. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn things over to Layla. All right, so it's my turn to share screen. Um, let me pull this up. Hey, oh, look at that. 
sorry. Okay, got ahead of myself there. So, um, hey y'all, I'm hoping you can see my screen, um, everything good. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about using political cartoons. And the reason I wanted to feature this one is because I wanted to rework it. I wanted to rework how we could use this one in a um, digital platform as well. This um, lesson plan is um, available on our website and it's highlighted in the newsletter, like Dr. Graham said, but it's only for in-person learning. So I know that we've kind of, we don't want to do everything virtual, right? But we want to have some aspects of virtual learning still um, in some ways. Maybe I'm speaking too much. Um, but I do think that it'd be nice to have a rework of our lesson plans for virtual learning in, um, in some way, shape, or form. So that's what I've kind of been reworking here. So we did this um, lesson plan, I think, in 2019, um, fall of 2019 at a teacher workshop um, at MTSU. Um, so we are going to be doing this lesson plan that we featured, but just with a digital spin. Um, so today we're gonna be using a Padlet within our Padlet. So a little bit of Padlet inception is gonna be happening today. Um, I worked hard on that one. I hope you enjoyed the Padlet inception. Um, so on our digging in Padlet um, that Dr. Graham shared the link for, go ahead and go to that. And then you will see another Padlet link for this activity. So go ahead and click on that for me. That's where our materials for this activity will be um, kind of living. And if you have questions, just put them in the chat box, let us know. And if you have your phone out, um, the QR code is right there for you to scan the Padlet or scan the code to get the Padlet. Okay, so this is what you should see. And I was really excited actually, Kira, because I didn't realize my Padlet background was the same as yours. Um, just kind of worked out that way. So here we have our materials and I have five political cartoons listed today. Since we are a small group, we're just going to be working with one political cartoon together just to model this activity. Okay, so if you have the Padlet up, I want you to go to this first. I didn't mean to move that, that back, go back. I want you to go to this first political cartoon link here and I can put this in the chat box as well. There you go. And we're gonna kind of play around with this cartoon together. So this part, this activity asks students to analyze these political cartoons, get into the images, the text, context, subtext of these cartoons, and then figure out what they tell us about the, the uh, Gilded Age. What are um, the political, social, economic factors influencing and resulting from the Gilded Age? So it, that link I just sent you, you have access to. And I created these jigsaw puzzles just using Jigsaw Planet. It's free, you just create an account. And as you find pictures you want, you can just save the JPEG from the Library of Congress. That's where these are from and just drop it in and it'll generate a puzzle for you. Um, so what you can do, and I like this feature here, you can play and you can pick how many pieces you wanna play as. I said it is like 30 to 40, but we'll just do 24 for time's sake. So on your own screen, if you wanna do the puzzle, you're, oh, Refresh, if you wanna do the puzzle yourself um, and we'll kind of work with it together. So this puzzle is, again, a political cartoon from the Gilded Age from the Library of Congress and it's available in that lesson plan. And what I like about this puzzle is that it clicks when you get the pieces together. You don't have to have any kind of guessing of did I put it in the right spot? If it doesn't stay together, then you've got the puzzle pieces wrong. Like if I tried to put this one right here, I could still move it, it's not gonna click together. So again, you can make this however challenging you want to make it, but this is just an activity for any political cartoon, no matter what the time period is, any picture, if you want students to kind of have a minute of fun as they're putting pieces together um, before you really dig into a lesson topic. I really like this Jigsaw Planet feature. Okay. Is testing my puzzle skills today. Autumn, are you going to beat me? <laughs> okay. I cheated. I made mine a little bit less. So, and I put all of these links on the Padlet. There are five political cartoons, but this is just um, one of them. This has a lot of text in it when you look closely. So that's why I picked it. Where's my other corner piece? Over there, hiding. Let's see. Okay, so once you get the puzzle put together, which has taken me a while because I'm on Zoom and doing multiple screens. Okay. 
that should go there. I feel like I'm missing a piece somewhere. It's gotta be hiding. Does anybody see my extra piece? There they are behind my, my screen that I'm sharing. Okay, perfect. So here's our puzzle. So again, you can make these as hard or as easy as you want to. Um, for students, you get a little congratulations at the end. Um, and once you get this puzzle solved, um, it might have some like different features on there. This is the site that the State Museum uses as well. So I, I assume it's okay, but um, there are other sites you can use if it's blocked. Um, but again, this is the one that the State Museum uses. So I assume it's appropriate educationally. Um, so this is what you get when you put the puzzle together. So the next part on our little piece here, as you're putting the puzzle together, after you finish that, for political cartoon one through five, I have put together these little pieces here um, that I will move to the Padlet. So transfer. Okay, so I'm gonna refresh this and there we have the info for political cartoon up now. So once you have that political cartoon put together, I have put together these pieces here for each political cartoon. Um, and this is the one that we just worked with. So I'm gonna display this for y'all for a minute. And I want you to just kind of look at this text here. What from this text sticks out to you? And I can probably go here and make it a little bit bigger. So what on this cartoon text um, or on the citation, the brief summary, what sticks out to you? And I can actually click on this right here is hyperlink. And we can look at the JPEG and kind of zoom in. And again, this is from the Library of Congress. So if we zoom in, what text do you all see? Let's see, New York. Yes, we see New York. What else do we see? Law. Look around. Treasury. Yes. About right here. Justice. Good. There's something here. It's kind of grainy here, but if you look really closely, there's another word there. And when we read the um, summary, you'll be able to see that a little bit more in depth. Okay. So lots of different pieces you could pull here. Cause when I first looked at this political cartoon two years ago now, I was like, there aren't any words on this, but when you zoom in, it's really, there's a lot of text there that you can work with. Okay. So the citation for this is a group of vultures waiting for the storm to blow over. Okay. So in this activity, we would then ask students to look at this cartoon, look at the text of the cartoon, look at the, um, Think about the context for when this cartoon is made, the historical context, what's happening, and the subtext, what is not being explicitly stated, right? So we have a text, context, subtext handout, and this is also linked on um, the Padlet under materials that we shared. So <laughs> you're fine, you're fine, take your time. As much time as you need on the puzzle. I've already done it like three times just to make sure it was right. So that's the only reason why I got it done quickly and I cheated and made it smaller. Um, so this is our text context subtext piece. So when looking at this, what text is visible to the reader? So let's look at this again. What text, Kira pointed it out, is visible to the reader, a lot of it. So we see New York, we see Treasury. Yay, good job, Autumn. We see rent payer, justice, suffrage, Liberty, a lot of these pieces here. Okay, so that's what we put in that text piece. Now context, let's look at this summary here and think about what's happening during this time period. So it says this cartoon drawn by Thomas Nast in 1871 depicts William Boss Tweed and his cronies as vultures. Tweed, 
the fat, balding vulture in the center, and gained notoriety as the boss of New York City's Tammany Hall. City officials jailed Tweed in 1873 for embezzling over 50 million of public funds. In the cartoon, Tweed and his cronies stand atop the corpse of a man labeled New York. Scattered around the nest is a muzzle labeled for the press and bones labeled suffrage, justice, law, liberty, rent payer, taxpayer, and New York City treasury. As a storm rages in the background, Tweed tells his fellows, let us pray. <laughs> I couldn't find those pieces at first either, either, Kira. So when we're thinking about the context here, what's happening when this cartoon is being created, when this cartoon is created? It's 1871. Um, think about that. In the chat box, let me know context-wise what's happening. Let's contextualize this cartoon. Reconstruction. Good. Yeah. So I mean, it seems like we're far away from the Civil War, but we're not, right? We're right in the height of Reconstruction, 1871. Okay, what else? I like to think, um, yes, the financial crisis around this time. Yeah, there is a financial crisis around this time as well. When we think of the Gilded Age, what does that term mean? When we're introducing this time period to our students, how would we define the Gilded Age for them? Think about that for a second. So the Gilded Age is this time period, right, where we have corruption, widespread corruption. Everything looks pretty on the outside. There's industry, there's success happening, but then we have a lot of corruption happening underneath. It's ugly underneath. Um, so really, in this time period, we could break that down too. So right after the Civil War, we're in Reconstruction, we have a lot of corruption happening, break down the meaning of the Gilded Age and what it means um, to our students, what they think it means and what the term actually means. Break down this brief summary. Uh, was Boss Tweed even, like you can talk about this with your younger students, was Boss Tweed a good guy? Let's look at this summary. What words do we think tell us that Boss Tweed was not a good guy, right? We see he's the fat, balding vulture in the center, first of all. And then we also see that he's embezzling, he's imprisoned. So Boss Tweed. Actually, I just asked Autumn that fourth grade level. Yeah. And I said, is he a good guy or a bad guy? Uh, and, and she said he's a bad guy because of the word like jailed. So just what yeah, you're saying, Layla. Yes, and... yes. Good, so. good job, Autumn. You did fantastic. So yes, we can just look at those words there and kind of talk to our students about the context surrounding not only this time period, but who Boss Tweed was um, in New York City. Good, okay. And the subtext piece. So we've done the text, the context, and the subtext. So what is between the lines here? Who created this source? Let's look back at the citation for a second. Who created this source here? Thomas Nast, good. Okay, so Thomas Nast is very well known for being a cartoon artist, right? At this time period, he's not only cartooning, um, not not only cartooning just like interesting cartoons but they're really calling out corruption he is kind of doing what jacob reese does with photographs but with his cartoons right he's kind of breaking up what's happening there good so what what else do we know or what else is not being said in this image autumn kind of hit it right on the head we're not necessarily saying he's a bad guy but by looking at this image and looking at the text we can see that he boss tweet is not a very um, good person um, being depicted in this drawing, right? So that's another theme, that corruption theme, okay? Who is this source created for? Who do we think this image here was created for? Yes, so discerning newspaper readers, right? The newspaper, good, readers of Harper. So people who are actually engaging with the press, right? Who are engaging in this news, people who want to know more. Um, and again, this is not favorable towards Thomas Nass. So he might see it as negative propaganda or maybe even untrue, spreading untrue things, right? But to our readers, they're reading it. And it, this is a way to get into media literacy as well. How are we digesting what, 
what is being presented by the media, right? And this again was put out for newspaper readers. Yeah, people who might actually participate in the political system. Good, and these little bones are hidden, right? When you look at it, it's not something that initially, like I said, when I first saw this, these words did not really stick out to me. I saw in New York, but that's about it. I couldn't really see anything else until I zoomed in on these pieces. So the people who are reading the newspaper, this might catch their eye, right? But they're really going to have to put some focus into this, um, into this cartoon and into those smaller little bones and the muzzle that has the press on it. You can't even read that, right? So they're going to have to really dig into this um, cartoon and figure out the meaning behind it or already have some idea of the meaning behind it, okay? And then why was this source produced when it was? And that really goes back to the investigative question of the, um, the uh, lesson plan, you know, like what did these political cartoons tell us about the Gilded Age, right? And we've talked about those underlining themes. So what, what does this political cartoon why do you think it was created in 1871 in the time period that it was created? Calling out corruption, good. Calling out um, not only the political corruption, the economic corruption, the social corruption that's happening, they're all intertwined. Good, so calling out the corruption of this time period and like we said, this is for newspaper readers, uh, people who are probably politically engaged. So really speaking to that political awareness, um, especially of a Democrat during a time that Republicans held power, good. So really calling out the party that's not necessarily in power at the point. Yeah, radical Republicans, good. So this is just a quick cartoon. I mean, I think we spent 10, 12 minutes together so far. Um, a quick cartoon analysis using the puzzle pieces and the um, text context subtext piece and then the citation and, and summary. And this is all available. The lesson plan is available on our website on that newsletter we just posted as well. And I have directions on there about cutting them up into physical puzzle pieces to give students if you're in person. Um, and then we have these pieces as well for the, um, the digital version. And for my people who are working digitally, I just wanted to show you one thing. So we do have a Jamboard for this as well. And I've used Jamboard in the past and people have been kind of confused. So I have these tips and tools up here. So when you're using Jamboard, this is a free application through Google. Um, everybody in the session in class can see what you type and access what you type. So if you are gonna use the Jamboard digital version of this, keep that in mind. Um, Jamboard, you can add sticky notes or a text box to engage with other people. And you can create as many pages as you want, but don't do that. The right arrow, I'll show you our Jamboard here. This will also be linked on our um, Padlet. So if you keep pressing this arrow past 11, it'll create new pages. So in big groups, when you're working with people, you have the cartoon, and then you have these post-it notes here if you're gonna work virtually. So in order to add a post-it note, I just wanted to model this for people who maybe wanted to use this digitally um, later on. So students would have access and they could just click this little sticky note piece here, add a sticky note, and then type in, we saw New York City under text, right? And we can just pull that there and students can collaborate in this way. And this is an easy way for students to type their answers while you're talking or collaborate in breakout rooms or just collaborate if you're one-to-one -one during the lesson because everybody can see this. If you have this Jamboard link, when you have it, you'll be able to see all the edits on there. And this is just a good way to also make sure students can see all the images, have all the citations. And um, again, I love a good digital collaboration piece. Um, so I didn't use the Jamboard for this because we have a small group today and I feel like we can just talk um, rather than just doing Jamboard together. But this is also gonna be linked on the Padlet and a part of that virtual lesson plan. So if you're watching this with us today or watching it with us later on um, for PD credit after that, just know that there will be a virtual component that includes a Jamboard piece and a Padlet piece on this lesson plan. Um, and the last piece of this lesson plan that's not included in my activity, we have an ESP um, handout. Sorry, there it is. Um, we have too many tabs open. An ESP handout that you could use to pull all this together and come back to that essential question. Um, 
what do these political cartoons tell us about the Gilded Age and really focus on the economic, social, and political pieces of these cartoons and how they all speak to that corruption and speak to progression um, all happening during the Gilded Age. All right, so you may have questions. All right, well, I'm gonna turn it back over. Um, Dr. Graham, are you going next? Okay. Yeah, I think I am. Um, Hi. With, with my assistant here, who's going to stay quiet during the rest of the presentation. Um, all right, great, thanks, Layla. That was a lot of fun. I brought her in because uh, I wanted to see an actual elementary school student at work on one of those jigsaw puzzles and that was great. Uh, I'm going to let her do the rest of them after the end of this. Okay. I'm going to share my screen again and go back to the newsletter. And uh, because um, our other graduate research assistant, October, uh, couldn't join us today, uh, I think she's traveling. Uh, I'm going to talk about her choice for the staff newsletter for this month. And I, I'm glad she picked it though, because it's one of my favorites too. Uh, it's one that we did back for the June 2017 uh, newsletter. Um, and it's about Harlem rent parties. And so October talks about why she chose this. this and it's because uh, it really struck her as an example of black joy uh, instead of just looking at African Americans in US history through the lens of their struggles, uh, it's also good to look at uh, their successes and their creativity uh, and the ways that they've influenced our culture for the better. And the Harlem Renaissance is a really great way uh, in the curriculum to do that. And so um, there's a, a really great source from the Library of Congress that's at the center of this lesson idea. And then of course, this really awesome map to go with it. And so this is something that, um, all right, I'm gonna bring up the newsletter in which it occurs originally, which is on the Jim Crow era. And so you can get to the links uh, from here. And of course, October also links to these through her review of this uh, in our current issue. And so there's a student packet that goes along with this where it takes this source, which is a text-based source and divides it into nine different sections. Um, Okay, so I'm just gonna show you uh, what the source is that is being highlighted. And it, it's from uh, the WPA collection, uh, the Federal Writers Project. Uh, so it's a little bit later in time than the Harlem Renaissance. This is from the 1930s instead of the 1920s. Um, but it's not like the Harlem Renaissance ends in 1929, right? So this is a 10 page long report of one of these F, uh, FWP, Federal Writers Project employees who is a white person and they're kind of going through Harlem and they're recording their impressions of Harlem rent parties uh, and it's, it's very interesting because we're used to things from this collection being like oral histories and a lot of people uh, speaking and a lot and maybe even some dialogue or some interview techniques. This is, this isn't that. This is a person telling a story of what they observed uh, going out. Uh, and uh, you can kind of sense the writer's culture shock in a few places. So this is a really interesting source when you read all of it together, um, but to make it a little easier for your students to read and actually think about it, uh, it's, excuse me, uh, it's been broken down. Okay, that link was not found. One moment, please. All right. Here's the student packet right here. Um, so 
you can see uh, in the student packet that uh, we've got your excerpt on the left hand side and then uh, there's a glossary around uh, in the right. Uh, sometimes it's because the the terms are a bit more um, uh, like dialect or slang or you know, and sometimes it's just a matter of vocabulary. Um, and, and then at the bottom of each one, there are a couple different questions for further thinking. So they can discuss it, like you can divide your class into nine different groups and have them read through it, uh, figure out the vocabulary, and then think about what's going on. And what I like about this passage is it doesn't just start off by talking about, I went to this party and this is what I saw, but the writer actually tries to work in the context for this in New York City by talking about how populated it has become and how many people are kind of crammed into the city blocks and all the different immigrant groups uh, that are represented. And so uh, it's really quite a mix, especially, you know, it's not just black people, it's black people that have a lot of different backgrounds. And so you have a lot of people who come from the deep south uh, who are moving to New York and, and they're almost experiencing culture shock the same way as you know white people kind of going through uh, the, the black part of town, uh, trying to hear the good music and see the interesting dancing and all that kind of thing. Um, but it does get uh, pretty cool when they're talking later about the party itself. Uh, so for instance, Saturday night, you know, gala night in Harlem and, and, and talking about how they're dressed, how they dance and, um, you know, how everyone's behaving. Sometimes they, they, he, the writer uses words like that make it sound like they're doing kind of primitive dancing. So it's a little bit culturally judgmental, uh, but it's, it's, it's also, they're, they're really wowed by the sense of abandonment uh, and these people really throwing themselves into having a good time. But the whole basis of a rent party is because you have, prices of rent skyrocketing and you have a lot of people who don't know how to make their rent payments and so they throw parties and the people who come to the parties have to pay a little admittance fee and that's how people made money to kind of supplement their the rest of their income so they could actually make rent payments and so everybody kind of there was always somebody throwing a rent party because so many people needed help making their rent. And so the whole reason why these things were in existence really speaks to a lot of economic situations in the city at this time. Uh, so you can discuss that. But this is also like making a great, like, like having a really great creative idea, a way to address what is an economic hardship is to make a cultural festival kind of thing out of it. And it was also a way for people to get to know each other. Um, in, and it helped contribute to the sense of community uh, for all these people coming from disparate backgrounds. And so um, one thing uh, that I wanted to show you, uh, there's a really great map that you can pair this with from the Library of Congress called the Nightclub Map of Harlem. And where is my, nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. Here it is, okay. So this is such a fun map. And it, it, I have to warn you, it does mention reefer and marijuana in a couple places. So you might need to uh, think about it before you, you know, think about what the students are gonna point out uh, before you give them parts. Uh, some of it's a little bit um, stereotypical in terms of, you know, ethnic stereotypes, you know, but it's also, it's, it's not, um, I don't think there's anything in it that would be like offensive, offensive, but then that's always something that kind of changes with your audience, but it's not, I don't think it's meant to be. I, I think this is something that's supposed to like actually just show you what are the different nightclubs of Harlem. And so you can kind of get a sense of the nightlife and all the different famous musicians and club leaders, uh, Bill Bojangles Robinson, the world's greatest tap dancer. I mean, that's an actual person. So where were they? Then of course here we've got Cab Calloway singing, you know, Heidi Ho. Uh, and you can just get a sense of the vibrancy of the neighborhood. 
and um, you know, and of course this, the various speakeasies uh, also mentioning that, and and this kind of really paints a visual picture of the kind of um, active nightlife kind of party oriented culture that is talked about in these excerpts for these rent parties. Um, and another thing, excuse me, I'm gonna try to get to this link. Uh, the original lesson idea after group six, uh, it invites you to look at um, this Slate article that came out. Oh, excuse me, my ad blocker doesn't want me to. Okay, there we go. Um, Slate did this article where you can actually see a collection of, can you, can you, or not? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't disable my ad blocker. You'll have to look at that yourself. Uh, maybe you'll be able to bring these up in just a second. I, I can't do it with this black bar moving across the top of my screen. But uh, you can see examples of what these little invitations look like. And so they describe, you know, who's having the party, where it is, and then like what the admission cost would be. And they're showing a couple examples from Langston Hughes's own collection. Uh, so that's pretty cool because he's somebody that you can directly connect and think about when you think Harlem Renaissance. And so um, you can think of him and other people like him maybe taking part in these kinds of things as well. And so um, let's see. So this is uh, a, an actual example of what would be written on one of these. Uh, there'll be brown skin mamas, high yellers too. And if you ain't got nothing to do, coming up to Roy and Sadie's. There'll be plenty of pig feet and lots of gin. Just ring the bell and come on in. So uh, making kind of a fun little tune out of it. Now you, you might, you, well, you would definitely want to explain that brown skin mamas and high yellers uh, are kind of derogatory terms uh, for certain tones of skin color among African Americans. And that's explained over here in the margin. Um, but these are, this is language used by the people themselves as well. Uh, and so you, you definitely want to have a discussion of vocabulary, but within the context of this is what the invitations sounded like. And And yeah, so, uh, and of course the food, there's lots of discussion of the food um, and you know some of the Southern food coming in, some of the kind of Creole food, uh, lots of different uh, styles from different parts of the country kind of coming together. So it, there's, there's really a, a lot to it. And you can see there's nine different sections. And then it's talking about how these kind of die out after the repeal of prohibition because well, with so many things, uh, you, once re prohibition is repealed, you don't need as many places to get illicit alcohol. And so the Harlem rent parties were actually a place where people went to get alcohol uh, during prohibition. And so that was part of their appeal. Um, all right, well, I am going to see if I can do one more thing before I hand this over to Kira. And that is, this is supposed to start off with a very short video clip. And I didn't check to make sure that this video clip was still working. Oh, here we go. So this is actual footage from what would have been, um, or maybe it's a staged kind of, okay, what goes on in a Harlem Rip party, guys? I'm gonna turn the cameras on and, and you go for it. Some dancing and music somebody's living room. Stacey, we're not getting any of the audio on it. I'm sorry about that. It's as loud as I can make it. Before the Renaissance. All right. 
So there is an overview of uh, something that's a, a bit different um, because this is the way that the student packet is. You could do it vis you know, virtually if you needed to, um, but it's it's a lot of fun to do in class because it, it tends to it tends to uh, create a lot of conversations among students, just figuring out what's going on. And of course, they all like the ideas of going to parties, so um, they, it might be engaging in that matter. And also to see like how different it is, but also maybe like what are the similarities. Um, all right, I'm gonna turn it over to Kira to look at some more stuff. All right, thank you, Stacy. Um, so let me pull up mine. So the lesson that I or the item that I picked for my favorite uh, is a lesson plan that I did a few years ago called "Crossing the Veil: A Young W. E. B. Du Bois in Rural Tennessee." Um, and the reason that I picked this one, one is it was a lot of fun to work on and, and develop this lesson plan. Um, I did this in partnership with uh, Barbara Marks, um, who has since retired from Watertown High School in Wilson County, and Taylor uh, Daniel uh, Kilgore, who uh, taught at DeKalb County High School when we were working on this and has since went down to uh, Whitwell Middle School. Um, so we originally wrote this and presented this lesson plan um, at the National Council for History Education um, in Niagara Falls uh, in 2016. So we picked this particular topic to do for this for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is, you know, of course we were at Niagara Falls and there is this like iconic image uh, where we see Du Bois um, here. Um, this is the founders of course of the Niagara movement which would later become the NAACP. Um, du Bois uh, is one of the leading uh, African-American intellectuals of the 20th century. He's the father of Pan-Africanism. Um, he's someone I've always been fascinated by. Um, but the bigger thing that drew us to this was actually the ties, the local ties to this book, um, The Souls of Black Folk. Um, of course, this is a book that a lot of folks, um, you know, wind up reading at some point um, in their education. And if you've had a chance to read it, you may recall that he actually talks in here about uh, some of his experiences while he lived in Tennessee as a student at Fisk. Um, and one of the things he talks about is his time teaching in a rural African-American school in Wilson County, uh, or actually the community is kind of on the Wilson to Cab County line. Um, and so since uh, all three of us are really were from, you know, that general area and all very familiar with Alexandria, where that school was at, um, this was something that we were particularly interested in. So we wrote um, this two-day lesson plan. Uh, it's geared towards high school. Uh, it includes a PowerPoint that has uh, quite a bit of notes uh, in it about Du Bois uh, to give you some context. And it includes an optional uh, extension activity uh, that's a little more elaborate than what we would typically include in some of our lesson plans. So the way the lesson plan is structured, um, the first day um, is really about helping students to understand some context for Du Bois before you kind of really get into his writing and his experience here. Um, so before we do that, though, we want students to kind of get understand what's happening um, in this time period. So they work with a few different sources, um, and two of the ones that they start with is this quote uh, from Henry Grady, um, who is the person who is credited with coining the term the New South, um, which was really a push that was done by some in um, both in, in kind of media and journalism as well as in the business community in the South to try to promote outside investment um, into the Southern economy post Reconstruction. Uh, again, trying to talk about, you know, we've, you know, slavery is over, we've dealt with all of our problems, like this is a great place to come spend your money. Um, and then the other source that we work with is this um, Harper's Weekly image. Uh, and so you see, again, this kind of comparison of like 1861 that we see up here in the corner with King Cotton, and then 1882. So we see kind of again this more industrial look uh, to the South. So again, showing them that their economy is changing. Uh, we see, um, you know, the female figure here, kind of like a Lady Liberty type figure working on a loom, but of course, cotton still being very important to the economy here. So again, the first part of this is just kind of helping them understand what's happening um, in the South in this, in this period. The next thing we want them to understand is what's happening with rural education in the South. Because um, of course, it's during kind of this post-Reconstruction period that we see a, the formation really of public education uh, across the South. And so there is a Prezi that you can use to give them some background and context. 
Um, there's an article that we link in here to again, give you some additional context that you can share with your students or you could have them look at. Um, and then there are two images that I've included here. Uh, one is of the Wheeler School. And this is the building that is believed to be where Du Bois taught uh, that was there in uh, Alexandria. Uh, later, it was used for different agricultural purposes, including being a corn crib. Um, and then the other school as a point of comparison is Doe Creek School, which is in Henderson County, uh, built around the same time period. Uh, and you can see also still very, uh, you know, kind of rudimentary building. Um, this one, of course, was used as both a church um, and a school, uh, which was pretty common during the period, um, as you did see a lot of the kind of church school combo. Um, the one uh, there, the Wheeler School, is a little different in that it, uh, I don't believe that it was a church. Uh, it was just used for school and then some other purposes um, during the time period. So again, first day, you kind of build context. Then the second day, we get into uh, understanding a little bit about Du Bois. Uh, we start uh, with the PowerPoint that we've included. Uh, and so the next few slides are included from that PowerPoint. And then there's some others that I've taken out for time purposes today. Um, but uh, so Du Bois grows up in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, he is, uh, from an early age, uh, he thinks that education is the way out of poverty. Uh, and education is the way to kind of advance himself in life. So he actually is able to go to school, uh, that's a school that is integrated, uh, and so and is fairly well supported by his you know teachers and, and fellow classmates. Now he understands though at the time that as he matures into adulthood that they don't see him as an equal, they don't see him as someone who would be able to take on like a position of community leadership, and so he understands that like really to continue to advance he's going to need to leave and experience kind of other places. So. Uh, and you can see here, this is one of the images, of course, of him with his, um, you know, his classmates and his teachers here, uh, there in Massachusetts. So he leaves Massachusetts and they actually raise money for him to be able to go to Fisk University. Uh, and this was a place he had long dreamed of going. Um, but at the time that he arrives at Fisk, it's really this very interesting period uh, in Tennessee in that we see the beginnings of Jim Crow happening. So, you know, 1870, we had the new constitution that introduced a poll tax. Uh, we also have the passage of miscegenation laws. We have passage of segregated uh, education laws. We also have uh, segregation on like streetcars and, and those kind of things. Um, and of course, it's in 1884, we see this uh, clip here where Ida B. Wells had been arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a streetcar, and she was actually uh, taking the state to court um, over this. So, you know, that's the Tennessee that Du Bois is entering into. So he comes to Fisk, and Fisk, of course, had started, you know, in the Reconstruction period in 1886, I'm sorry, 1866. Um, and so it starts out and it's, you know, a mix of kids or people really from the age of seven to 70. Um, you kind of just basic education in those first years. And then as the school evolves, they have a big focus on being able to train teachers to then go out to work in these schools and other areas across, especially across the South. So um, they build Jubilee Hall here in the years just prior to when Du Bois arrives. So he gets to Fisk, uh, and we see him here actually um, there in the corner. And it's really the first time that he is surrounded uh, by other African Americans and really kind of immersed in African American culture in a, a very different way than what he'd experienced in Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, what we see at Fisk during the time period is that you had students from, uh, you know, some from very impoverished backgrounds, and then you had some that were coming from fairly affluent families where you had, they were, you know, fathers might have been ministers or barbers and had their own businesses. So it's a really interesting mix of people that are coming together here at Fisk. And of course, a lot of times it's those, you know, more affluent students who are really kind of helping to shape the culture there and shaping this um, idea of wanting to strive to, again, improve the circumstances for the race. And so that is very much what Du Bois is immersed in um, here during his time at Fisk. But he understands that, again, if, if education is going to be the key, there's a lot of kids who are never going to get a chance to come to Fisk, and though the way to help them might be to actually get out into some of these rural areas and be exposed to them. So he, um, after his second year at Fisk, um, enters this teacher training program in Wilson County. Uh, and we have in the PowerPoint and lesson plan, actually, you can find the document where he got his like, certification. 
Um, and so he, you know, he gets that uh, there in Wilson County, probably uh, happened somewhere near where Cumberland University is now. Um, and then he sets out to find a school that needs a teacher. Um, and so he finds that in um, Alexandria um, at the Wheeler School. And so um, he lives with one of the local families and teaches there in the summer at the seasonal school. So we don't have any actual images from his time um, teaching uh, there, uh, but we do have this image. So it's probably a little bit later, um, but we can see kind of school is kind of comparable in nature, probably comparable resources. So this kind of gives us an idea, I mean, a sense of maybe what uh, Du Bois' student population might have looked like and kind of what, you know, gives us an idea of what that might have been. The other cool thing that I found um, source-wise in this one is this just uh, this brief uh, piece that he wrote while he was at Harvard. Um, of course, this is after he has finished at Fisk and moved on to the next phase in his education. And so he writes this description of Alexandria, and I include in the PowerPoint the actual transcript of this. Um, and so it's really interesting to see, again, how he describes the town, how he makes note of, you know, there, the nearby towns called Liberty and Prosperity, and yet kind of the, the backbreaking labor that are going on and, and kind of the, the circumstances of people there. So it's a really interesting piece to kind of get inside his head and get a sense of what he thought of the area. Because again, someone who's coming from a very different background with a lot of culture shock um, here. So after you've had a chance to kind of give students uh, this background, let me switch for just a second to, oh wait. Are you guys seeing the lesson plan now? Okay, so what you follow up with after kind of giving students this kind of background into Du Bois and his life is actually having them read an excerpt from Souls of Black Folk. And so this is included in the lesson plan. The excerpt is about a, almost a page and a half, two pages. Um, and the first part of it, of course, is talking about, you know, when he sets out to you know, find the school, he talks about uh, you know, one of his students in particular, Josie, that he spends a lot of time talking about. Um, and there's a couple passages in here that always really stand out to me. Um, and so one of them here is this one right here, where it says, there were, however, some, such as Josie, Jim, and Ben, to whom war, hell, and slavery were but childhood tales, whose young appetites had been wedded to an edge by school and story and half-awakened thought. And so again, this idea that you had this generation that there were so many possibilities for them that they hadn't been scarred by, you know, by slavery and by the Civil War in the same way that some of their elders had been. And then goes on in the excerpt to talk about he comes back to the area 10 years later um, to check up on, you know, check in with people and kind of catch up. And he finds out that Josie has, has since died. Um, and, you know, in the excerpt, it talks about again, kind of what happened to her and to Jim and kind of this, you know, these horrible circumstances that, you know, had led to, to her dying. Um, and then the passage ends with, my log schoolhouse was gone. In its place stood progress, and progress, I understand, is necessarily ugly. How shall man measure progress there where the dark-faced Josie lies? Thus, sadly musing, I rode to Nashville and Jim Crow Park. So I think, at one, you get really get a sense, again, of Du Bois and, and being the very eloquent writer that he is, but this is this heartbreaking passage where again, he's posing like the tragedy of this young girl who he saw so much promise in as a child when he was teaching her. And then she has since, you know, died. But yet we talk about the progress that had been being made during the time period. And so, you know, while he, here he has been, you know, the first African-American student at Harvard, he's done all these things and there has been progress. What happens to all these other people where that progress has really left them, you know, has left them and they have not seen any of that. Um, and especially, as again, as he mentions, the Jim Crow car. So students then get a chance. There is a uh, sheet here with some questions that you can use with students uh, to help them kind of process some of the things that we've done on that second day, including kind of comparing the circumstances uh, that have shaped him up to this point in Great Barrington at Fisk and then at his time in Alexandria. And then the lesson plan ends with an essay prompt. Um, how did the veil hinder progress for African-Americans? And of course he talks about the veil and progress a lot in Souls of Black Folk. Um, and so that's a really good way to kind of help students 
to, to challenge him to think about again how he's using these terms uh, and especially during this time period. So this again, written for high school, you can use it in you know, United States history, African American history, or um, in English. Uh, and so I, hopefully you guys uh, you know, can make use as a piece of this. I think it's, again, it's one of my favorite that we've done, um, again, partially because of that local connection. All right, so if you have questions, drop those in the chat box and I'm gonna leave, th turn things back over to Stacy. We just have a few minutes left. And so I just want to show you uh, a few more of the resources. Um, but I do want to also invite uh, our participants to put comments in the or questions in the chat box if you want to um, kind of bring them up before we go. Oop, I forgot to share my screen again. Um, all right. So uh, kind of, so you can see uh, there's young W.B. Du Bois that Kira was just talking about in our current issue of the newsletter. For the important links box, we have the political cartoons that relates to the lesson that Layla was talking about at the very top of the links box. And then uh, we went through and we picked uh, some kind of random things that we liked. Some of these were created by former graduate research assistants that we wanted to highlight again because they did a great job. And um, some of them because they're, they're you know, pretty interesting uh, in their own, we think all our work is interesting, but you know what I mean. Uh, and then we have a featured feature. Uh, some of you may remember that every now and then we invite a guest, article writer to uh, give us something to put uh, in a newsletter if, you know, if we know that they work in the field that the topic is related to. And so uh, I went through all of those and hopefully I didn't leave any of them out and, and pick them all out uh, because uh, they're not lesson ideas. So you, it's not like you use them in the classroom, but these are great little bits of information. They have specific ideas in them for you to use and maybe even sometimes primary sources. Uh, but they're really good, uh, like this one on politics and primary sources that um, one of our university provosts, Dr. Mark Burns, wrote for us uh, at the time he was dean of the College of Liberal Arts, and before that he was a professor of political science. So this is a, a nice kind of lengthy, but you know, if you can read it in five minutes, um, article that he wrote for us uh, back in September 2012. So it's that kind of thing. Um, that uh, many of our wonderful colleagues and uh, professional contacts have written and I wanted to give them an extra shout out by putting them all in one place if you just kind of want to skim through those. And then we have four uh, just more ones that we really, really liked. Um, so we're going to be doing um, the topic of labor for our next one. Uh, so that will be uh, a, a little bit more serious in tone. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, so yeah, uh, basically, if anyone has any questions, uh, if not, then um, Kira, I don't know if you wanted to share any kind of announcements or anything like that. Yeah, so just a couple things. Uh, one, if you guys would, uh, or want to run to the, the link for the palette there, and then what we'll do for our folks today is if you guys want to send us your addresses, we will give books to everyone today. Um, and then lastly, if you will do our short survey. So we'll drop again this in the chat box there. Uh, and so you guys can fill out that survey for us. Um, and that's for folks too later on who might be viewing this as a recording, um, fill out that same survey and then we will get you PD credit uh, for watching the recording as well. Um, and as Stacy mentioned, we are going to be doing labor as our topic next month, uh, and that will be on September the 9th. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, uh, please let us know. Um, and we also have coming up our Discover Tennessee History webinar series. If you uh, participated in that last year, uh, we will be doing that again with our various partners um, you can find information about that on our website, uh, as well as announcements for other upcoming uh, workshops and webinar um, opportunities. 
So again, thank you guys so much for joining us today and we hope to see you again next month.